All right, folks. So I'm going to continue from yesterday, and then I'm going to answer some questions that you might have regarding the lab lab quiz or anything regarding to lesson number 10. So if you recall from yesterday, we left off at genetic engineering, and we were looking at the two components of genetic engineering, plasmids and restriction enzymes, and those help to form recombinant DNA, which is just the DNA uh, chunk that has multiple sources that are integrated into it. So we're going to look at one example that's very, very important, as noted by my spider Shalka, which shows just how important this DNA splicing is to us as humans. Because when we look at how insulin is produced, uh, the insulin that diabetics utilize, this insulin was produced by bacteria that we've kind of hijacked, inserted in that human genetic component that produces insulin, and we tricked the bacteria into producing insulin. So we look at the chromosomes and plasmas that are responsible for production within that bacterial cell, and we look at this, the DNA that is a part of human, normal human cells that produce insulin. And that gene that's responsible for producing insulin is hot, is isolated. So we remove that from a healthy cell that produces insulin. And that gene is then inserted into a plasmid, which is then inserted into a bacterial cell. And then that bacteria is then, it's going to grow, it's going to divide, and it's going to produce bacteria. Oops. It's going to produce bacteria that all have that same genome that uh, for that insulin gene. So that insulin gene, that production of insulin, will be possible by all those bacteria cells. And then as a result of that, those bacteria cells, once they finish growing, that it's going to produce insulin. So then that insulin is then collected, and it's used for treatment of type 1 diabetes. So what they do is they separate it, and they distill it to create this pure insulin from those bacterial cells. So people who have type 1 diabetes who are unable to produce insulin can get their insulin from essentially a bacterial cell that's been hijacked and forced to produce insulin. So it's kind of cool. The And this happened, you know, in the 70s. We were capable of doing stuff like this in the 70s. And it's come a long way since, which you'll kind of read up more on this uh, in this lesson and as well in the coming days. So looking at gene therapy as a treatment for unwanted genetic or genome errors or issues is another method with which we can utilize this type of gene editing or recombinant DNA to kind of help humans. So gene therapy relies on what's called recombinant DNA reaching target cells. And in human, uh, we, we usually use viruses, ironically enough, uh, to deliver what's called a vector to insert foreign DNA into cells. So for example, uh, we have a hepatitis virus, which is quite infectious, and then we will be able to infect, quote unquote, the target cells of the liver because the hepatitis virus attacks the liver. And so that virus, if we input the right genetic information into that hepatitis virus, it will go to the liver, insert that genetic information into the liver cells. But instead of it giving you hepatitis, A, B, C, which have you, it will give you and deliver that target vector gene into those liver cells. So again, this is quite advanced stuff. It's not quite as simple as that, but it is a hyper simplified method with which we're looking at here. So the three main steps for gene therapy involve choosing a virus to inject specific cells with. We then have to modify that virus to make it less harmful, but also to contain that human gene of interest, whatever it is that you're looking to change the genome of that specific cell, you want to make sure that that virus has the specific genes of interest required to change the cell structure and function. And then we're going to infect that patient with the modified viruses. The virus then puts the good copy, quote unquote, of genetic information in, and it takes out that bad copy, so to speak. So there's some key important things to realize about it. It's still very, very, very experimental. And as you'll see in the week three outline, and the, the activity that we have you doing, you'll start to understand just why it's still so experimental and how it is slowly progressing, but where we are right now. Uh, and some challenges include that the virus may still be infectious and it's gonna cause diseases. So even if we change and alter it, viruses are very, very, very stubborn in that regard. We learned about them in, in unit one and how even though they're not part of that um, evolutionary tree that we all, all living species kind of fit on, they're so infectious and they're so good at infecting us 
again, ironically enough, in ter- current current circumstances. But that virus that we might utilize for uh, any type of gene editing, it might still be infectious. Uh, the gene may be inserted into the wrong location, or the gene may be inserted into specific somatic cells, uh, will not be passed on to offspring. Only genes edited in gamete cells will produce egg and sperm that will be passed to offspring. Those two things are kind of one and the same as far as I'm concerned, simply because the location really matters and whether or not that disease gets passed on to someone else is also a huge component of it. Uh, So that's it pretty much for this lesson. You have some activities to do for the week three outline, so please take a look at it. And if you have questions, I would more than happy to answer them now.